This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Holger Seim, professor of English at the University of Toronto. Holger's research covers a range of subjects in literary studies, but in this talk, we will focus primarily on his perspectives as a revisionist historian of the early modern London theater of Shakespeare's time, and also on his work in the area of German theater and modern performance. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Hello, Holger. Good afternoon to you. Hello, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, I want to start out by tell, letting our audience know, if they don't already, that your work ranges from early modern drama with a focus on theater history and performance to modernist and contemporary performance, specifically in German theater. So there's a sort of uh, British, uh, not British, probably English German connection there, older uh, 16th, 17th century England. And then you get into uh, German and to the modernist Brecht and uh, some of the famous playwrights of that period. Um, and you do a range of other things that we'll try to get to. Uh, <laughs> but let's start with the Shakespeare, <clears throat> the Shakespearean theater, or more broadly speaking, the early modern stage, because I know you go off Shakespeare, and that's very important in your work, and with the various uh, salient points that you have forwarded and will forward soon in forthcoming <laughs> publications that offer us a revised understanding of the theater and the material culture of that time yeah yeah i think that's true i mean it's sort of it's you know i've been working on this for the better part of a decade um and it's really i mean but 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 mainly in the form of essays and and, and articles and sort of introductory things and now this um sort of short volume that i'll be doing for for cambridge in their their elements series and at some point you know i hope to shape this into an actual book length um uh the, the summer is sort of summer but um it, yeah i'm i'm my my big theater historical project i guess um to speak grandly is to think through a lot of the um the things that we we and by we i mean you know sort of early modernists people who who who, who learn about shakespeare and the peer and that period um uh, actors, um, uh, theater makers, least of all theater historians, but basically any, which there aren't that many actually, but like but basically everyone in the, in, everyone who touches Shakespeare um, and it learns sort of standard truths about what we think we know about the theater of the time. Um, and I'd like to look at those uh, some assumed truths um, with a degree of skepticism and see how many of them actually are true and and if if there aren't if it isn't the case that many of those assumptions or many of those traditionally um, established um, ideas are actually based on prior assumptions that that have have in the intervening decades in many cases been proven to not be particularly stable or reliable um and if we can't tell more interesting stories about uh the theater of the period um that's the broader project um and i'm you know a lot of those a lot of those uh, the things that have cast doubt on uh, established narratives come out of archaeology, and and I know you had Heather Knight on here um, a while ago, who I think has in many ways been instrumental, or should have been, should be instrumental in a just world, um, in um, enforcing us on the 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 theatre historical, but also the literary historical uh, side to really reinvent uh, our narratives um, about what we think. <clears throat> 
uh, was normal, uh, what, what we think the spaces that Shakespeare and his contemporaries wrote for and acted in and went to as audience members were, what those spaces were like, um, what those audiences were like, um, what acting companies were like, how they functioned, um, how many of them there were, what success looked like, like a lot of really fundamental things. Um, and you know, it, it, my sense is that the kind of theater historical narratives that circulate broadly in our field and really in the sort of discipline very broadly conceived at large um, beyond early modernists, but like um, our students, theater makers who deal with material from this period, very broadly conceived. Um, the narratives that circulate outside of the very small confines of the community of theater historians that basically congregate at the Shakespeare Association of America meeting every year, like, the, I don't know, the 25 people or so that are the regulars, um, uh, many of whom are basically skeptics and don't believe anything. Um, but, but beyond that, I think there's sort of a, they, 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 there's a willingness to trust in compelling narratives. And those narratives haven't essentially shifted in quite a few decades now. Um, and in some ways they haven't shifted in a century. Like there are things that, that you can read in W.W. Gregg um, 120 years ago at this point, um, or in, or in E.K. Chambers, that still remain in broad circulation, even though they really shouldn't be. Like they're, 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 there's no basis for many of those assumptions and those theories. Um, but because, partly because theater historians are a relatively small and self-contained group, and those of us who are in, who reach out beyond that small and self-contained group are far and few between, and maybe because there's a bit of a tendency among those people who go outside that, that small seminar um, to believe, to not, to not self-revise excessively over the decades, let's say. I think we're stuck uh, in the field a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and and theatre history has become, even though early modern theatre history, and we'll probably get to this uh, in a bit more detail later, early modern theatre history has an absolutely astonishingly tiny um, basis in data. <laughs> I mean, this, I mean, I, it, the, 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 the four volumes of Chambers' Elizabethan stage are essentially still more or less where we are. We've added a bit to that, mm -hmm. but not a ton. Um, and compared to other periods of theater history, it's an absolutely ludicrous record that we're working with. Um, so it, really, theater history should be, in many ways, the part of the discipline that is most contested and where we're most willing to, to rethink our established narratives and to, to give new readings to old documents. Um, but we haven't. Uh, I mean, and then, broadly speaking, right? Of course, there are they're, they're, they're people who have, um, and I can sort of list them off, right? I mean, they're, they're names that many of your listeners will also be familiar with. I'm thinking of people like Rosalind Knudsen or David Kathman, um, my, my, my now retired colleague, Leslie Thompson. Um, people like that have done a lot of really quite revisionist work, um, but because they, I think their audience often is other theater historians, mm -hmm. Um, the kind of explosive potential of their work has not really, um, well, been realized in the, in, 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 in the discipline at large. Um, and I think it's time, it's, 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 it's time for that to happen. Um, yeah, it helps. It helps if you use initials for your name, like WW or EK, or I guess <laughs> if we go into literature, JRR or CS <laughs> and Lewis. But there was a whole two or uh, two generations of uh, scholars who really uh, had branded their names and had these, you know, magnificently researched works, but they uh, they became very confident in what they were saying. Now, a couple of uh, small examples, well, not small, really, but a couple of examples 
uh, we're, we're kind of in a period where we know that the theater rose in London, maybe over some time, but there was, I think it's not contested, there was a kind of burst somewhere in the mid 70s, maybe before 1570s. And it became, it, it was focused with two major theaters, the theater and the curtain that were in shortage north of the river, right? And then there are other theaters uh, in there are theaters all over the place, really, when you start looking. Uh, but those are sort of the focus uh, of, of things. And uh, for instance, the Globe Theater later comes in a theater, you know, kind of uh, takes over on, uh, on South Bank. And there's been this in, uh, uh, this kind of general understanding of the theaters as, as being uh, uh, the, the round O, the wooden O. And that stuck. And in fairly recent time, and I remember you and Heather Knight talking about this at the <laughs> Roehampton Conference when uh, Andy Kesson organized, that uh, they started digging and they found that the Curtain Theater wasn't necessarily, in fact, it was rectangular. It was clearly rectangular. Yes. So that yes. sort of thing. Right. And then I know you do uh, another smaller indoor or outdoor uh, and you're you're primarily an outdoor guy. That's uh, that there. It's, it's an outdoor. And by outdoor, we, we mean amphitheater that, that would be partially covered in, in some cases, but uh, open air that those kinds of things. But see, see, OK, so the outdoor indoor division makes it sound like these are two completely separate sorts of performance venues. Um, but in fact, like one of the interesting things about the those archaeological discoveries which have revealed that um, the curtain playhouse was rectangular and had some other features that really don't sit well with our established narratives. For one thing, the stage at the curtain runs basically the width of the auditorium and does not extend into the auditorium. So it's much, it's a configuration that's much more like um, a 19th century proscenium stage where the most almost probably the entire audience is in front of the stage and the actors are speaking out at it right rather than being immersed in the audience which is sort of I think the the standard model of how for the entire 20th century basically people have begun to think Shakespeare works <laughs> that the actors and the, the audience share a space uh, and it's really the curtain makes this quite unlikely yeah. as a model now here's the interesting thing though so the curtain's rectangular and we might then go like oh yeah yeah but that's weird because we know all these other wooden o's we know the standard shape of an early modern playhouse is polygonal slash round well if that makes the indoor playhouses all of which were rectangular um look like a different thing, right? Like a different genre of performance venue. But of course, that's only true if you think that the normative shape of an outdoor playhouse is polygonal. If there is no such thing as a normative shape for a playhouse, then the rectangular indoor playhouses are basically the same shape as, uh, as a theater like the curtain. Um, and in fact, as is now, so the other, the other, the other big archaeological dig that happened with less fanfare than the curtain, um, oh God, when was this now? Two years ago, almost, um, was the discovery of the of of, of the red lion uh, from the 1560s, which is also rectangular, um, and you then they pile up um, the the boar's head. Um, there's the um, Oh God, now I'm blanking. But basically, the, you, you, can, you can sort of, the more you, if you list all the rectangular playing spaces that we know of um, after 1600, which also includes the Fortune Playhouse in North London, which is a, a, a built from completely from scratch as a, as a square, in fact, structure. Um, and if you then go back into the 1570s and, 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 and listen to Andy Kesson, who, who has been, who's been insisting for years now that we have to take the inns seriously as, as, as venues. So these, in, these yards of inns that were repurposed and uh, as, as, as performance venues, well, those yards were also rectangular and maybe unevenly shaped, but definitely, definitely not polygonal in any recognizable sense. And suddenly you sort of get to the point where you might think, oh, well, maybe when um, 
when James Burbage built the theater in North London in 1575 or six or thereabouts. Um, and he built the bloody thing in a polygonal shape and called it the theater. He was doing that as a marketing stunt because to make it look different from all the mm -hmm. other existing playhouses. Mm -hmm. And maybe that stunt took for a few, for, for, for one generation of playhouses. And then you have Henslow at the Rose copying that shape. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have um, the Swan also on the South Bank copying that shape, but making it bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the Burbages and a few members of the Chamberlain's men taking the timber from the theater and carrying it across the river and building the globe from it and building the globe polygonally. But of course they would, because they have all these little pieces of timber. They're not going to make a, a rectangular structure out of that. <laughs> um, but that's where it ends. Like the globe in 1599 is the last polygonal playhouse. And you could argue that it's not polygonal because they wanted a polygonal playhouse, but because that's the timber they had. And when it burns down in 1613 and they rebuild it, well, they have the foundations. They can't really, like it would be much more expensive to, to tear those down and reinvent them as rectangular. But basically every polygonal playhouse after the Swan, that's 1594, every polygonal playhouse has it's basically has its hand forced into that shape. It's not that shape um, for, for, for uh, w w without sort of constraint. So you could argue that there are really only um, three, three polygonal playhouses, um, the theater, the rose and the swan that are that shape because someone said, oh, a playhouse ought to be polygonal. Yeah. And then you have, I mean, a, about a dozen rectangular playing spaces well then what's normative yeah well i i want our audience outside of the 25 people you mentioned i think it's more well, than yes. that because uh we we're dealing with scholars who are heavily invested in the roundness of the theater and so this yes. is very bad after you have publications and you make sort of a reputation and that's part of your reputation that it's very bad to learn that this theater wasn't shaped the way uh, or that that wasn't the <laughs> primary shape. And also, if you're in, if you're a director, if you're someone trying to get a sense of how or recreate how plays were acted, how they were done, this changes everything. This is, uh, this is the shape how actors are blocked, where they enter, where the tiring house was if it was at all, whether they just had to dive behind yeah. a curtain. And it matters to actors and directors and theater people, uh, even now when they're trying to re-envision how to, to do a, a stage play, depending on what kind of space they are afforded. And oh, massively, yeah. massively, right? And you, of course, I mean, it's and of course, it's not just like I mean, you might publish a few articles that sort of in, envisage, say, the globe a certain way, and then it turns out it's not like that way. It's not that way. Well, okay, so you have to revise yourself. Not, not that bad. It happens, right? New data is discovered. You change your, you, you, you revise your hypothesis. That's just good. That's just good critical thinking and scientific method and what have you, right? That's what we're supposed to do. I think it's somewhat different if you've actually built an enormous building based <laughs> on that assumption. That would be the, then, the, um, the modern uh, globe. Yes. yes, okay. I know that you yes. have some. <laughs> well, let's, well, no, talk I mean, about, let's talk about that a bit, the sure. modern globe. Sure. Uh, beloved but, I mean, it's many. basically... Oh, no, no. And it's like, you know, I love it as a performance space, but it's definitely too big. I mean, that's just that there's, there's the only way you can sustain the idea that it was that it's as big as it should be is if you ignore the, the modern globe reconstruction in London was already being conceived and had advanced quite far when the found when a small section of the foundations of the actual globe was unearthed. Um, and then began a fairly involved um, effort on the part of the theater historians associated with the globe, re the reconstructed globe, to explain away those archaeological findings. Um, and, to, and, and, and to basically argue that, well, they could still be compatible with the size of building that, they, that we are building. Uh, as far as I can tell, the, uh, there isn't a single archaeologist who believes that the thing, that the, the bits of, of brick and mortar they found 
at the location of the original globe um, could be uh, interpreted as part of a 20-sided polygon, which is what the modern globe is. They're either 16 or 18 and more likely 16, which is a considerably smaller building than the modern globe. And that, of course, raises all kinds of issues, right? It raises issues about the relationship between the audience and the actors. It raises questions about acoustics. It raises questions about light because a larger polygon obviously admits more light than a smaller polygon because um, the opening is smaller, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It raises questions about the size of the stage and what kind of stage could be reasonably accommodated in that smaller uh, polygon and so on. Um, and the, the problem is, the problem with a reconstruction like, like Shakespeare's Globe in London is that it's a perfect, it's, it's a great theater. I don't know I like, I, 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 uh, but it's just not, if we think of it as, a, as something like a, like a lab where you can put on theater historical experiments and see how they, how they would have worked in the original globe, well, it's a lab in which the Bunsen burners are at the wrong temperature and, 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 and your test tubes are made of too brittle glass or something like that. It's the, 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 the materials you're working with are contaminated. So you can't, you, you can't, you, you're never gonna uh, have the, the result in the experiment that corresponds to any kind of historical reality. The people at the Globe always get really mad at me when I say, but it's a great theater and great performances take place there. But I really, because they think it's condescending, but I don't mean it that way. I really think that. I, mean, I, I think it's an awesome theater. It's one of my favorite theaters in London. Um, it's just not, it's just not Shakespeare's Globe. It's ours. I, I I see. And also this notion, I wanted to probe into the notion of, well, we would say Shakespeare's globe, but if we if we were in what the year 1599 or the turn of the century there, uh, that globe theater would be occupied primarily by a Shakespearean company, mm -hmm. but not necessarily a full Shakespearean repertoire. Uh, there would be, uh, you know, when, when you start looking about it, it, it into it, Shakespeare, of course, a major figure, even in his time, but he uh, sort of blends in with a lot of other playwrights, a lot of other plays, and, uh, and then we start getting a broader picture of what this boom in the theater, in, uh, 16th century theater, was like. Yeah. Oh, definitely. De definitely. And it's also not necessarily the, aha, I told you my dogs would make a, would make a contribution to the conversation yes. sooner yeah, or later. This is a dog, this is <laughs> um, a dog friend, friendly podcast. I know, here. I, yes. I, I, I know that. Yes, I know that. I was very pleased to hear Emma Smith's dog. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> contribute. So. Her, her dog contributed to the podcast. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an international con canine conversation at this point. Um, <laughs> so, um, but no, no, I mean, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, Shakespeare is obviously an important playwright, maybe, maybe at least for a good while the most important playwright in the repertory of the Chamberlain's men slash King's men, which is the company that he was a part of. He was, he was a, a, a fee paying member of, um, and that's the company that is res that owns some members of which also own the globe. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, 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 given that Shakespeare wrote on average two plays a year, we can be absolutely certain that, it, that, that his plays were um, at most a significant factor, but never the majority of plays staged by that company in any given year. Um, given that at least during Shakespeare's lifetime, they probably would have commissioned somewhere between 10 and 20 new plays a year. Um, I mean, if we're assuming, so this is right, I mean, again, so received narratives. Mm -hmm. um, we have one document to base all these assumptions on, and that's the business ledger of Philip Henslow, who owned the Rose, um, and who wrote for th about three years, kept a record of the plays that primarily two of the companies performing at the Rose um, put on. And so from that record, we have extrapolated um, a, a narrative about all theaters and all companies of the period and not just the 1590s, but in but to the 16, late 1630s, basically. Uh, and we have very little to check 
uh, to check that narrative, right? To say, well, is it actually true that what the Admiral's men, that's the company at the Rose in the, the 1590s, what the Admiral's men did um, in those years, um, we have very little to show that their practices were the same as those um, other companies practiced and that companies of later generations practiced. But if we take what's in Henslow as, again, normative, um, then we can say, well, a company probably introduced a new play about every two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so unless a playwright, I mean, you know, there are some playwrights that we know were absolutely staggeringly productive. Um, uh, as, as someone like like um, hey, Thomas Haywood, uh, who, who claimed to have a, um, a hand or at least a main finger in 300 plays. Um, but Shakespeare didn't, right? I mean, Shakespeare wrote at, at, at most, what, 36 plays or so? Um, and some of the very early ones may not, in fact, have been in the repertory of the Chamberlain's men. So if he wrote about two plays a year in his active years, well, that means that Shakespeare was an important part of the repertory, but not the entirety of that repertory. And also, and this is sort of the part where I think our own, the centrality of Shakespeare to our own theatrical ecosphere um, it, it, um, it makes us jump to conclusions for which we actually have no data. Um, I think we often assume that, well, of course, Shakespeare's plays did well. And people didn't go, I don't know, um, as all's well that ends well, nah. Um, but they actually may have, and we don't know. We don't yeah, yeah. know. We don't um, know yeah. I mean, we, we kind of know that Othello and Hamlet and King Lear uh, and Richard III and Twelfth Night did well. And we kind of know that because there's stories about those plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or references to them, or references to actors performing in them. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of Shakespeare's plays, we have no evidence that they were performed <laughs> at all. I mean, they were, of course, otherwise he wouldn't have written them. But there are plays in Henslow's diary that show up once and then are gone. There are many plays in Henslow's diary that show up like five times, and then they've run their course and no one wants to see them anymore. And it's entirely possible that for a lot of Shakespeare's plays, that was also true. We just don't know. Yeah, uh, we unfortunately don't have the th same kind of uh, reviewing industry uh, as you have in London <laughs> and New York, uh, where you can tell, you know, how long you, you could tell how long a play ran in, on Broadway or on the West End. And you could look at, uh, I don't know, Time Out magazine, New York Times, whatever. And you could have a uh, superb chronicle. This is more like my hometown, maybe back in the 80s <laughs> or 70s. How many people went to see this movie and said, well, well, I, I don't know if we have any record of this, you know, how, if we can. And I do want to kind of pivot in a, a little bit into theater going. Now, these are hmm. uh, these are primarily afternoon productions, do you think? Uh, and uh, there's a growing population. We read, you know, there's always a growing population in London, but there really was <laughs> a growing population and apparently very enthusiastic. But there was uh, competition and there were people, of course, who uh, uh, apparently could get off work to go to these plays and uh, and did often. And so you did have to keep new things coming in, just like you do now in the West End. Yeah. You know what? I mean, that's something I often wonder about. And we don't really, I, I feel like we don't talk about it, um, it uh, as scholars. Like, in that, they're, uh -huh. you know, they're, they're sort of a set of, of, of standard scholarly works about Shakespeare's audiences. Uh, or the audiences of that time. Um, uh, uh, Cook and Gur are the two books, basically. Yeah. And we've sort of, then there's a, there's sort of, there's been, been follow up and anecdotes that have been recovered. But the sort of fundamental question of, of how the hell did thousands of people in London simply not go to work? 
I go to the because because it's it's definitely not the case that all the people going to the theater are aristocrats and and courtiers and and people like Samuel Pepys in the later 17th century who just clearly didn't need to go to work if they didn't feel like it and and there were no consequences. Um, I mean, a lot of those people were apprentices, like notoriously, but that's always like. That, that's sometimes offered as a sort of explanation. Well, yeah, they were apprentices. Well, so what? Apprentices still had a job. I mean, yes. why, could they, why did they have to work? Um, and so this is, I, it's it's one of the big bafflements to me that 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 going to the theater was just some, I mean, we often sort of look down our, our noses at the Puritans, right? All this, this the, the anti-theatrical faction, um, all the people that, that said that sense of moralizing bitter things about the theater. but. In some ways, they kind of had a point. <laughs> I mean, if you, if oh, you, they surely did. I mean, particularly any kind of a Sunday or a Holy Day performances, which I, I'm not clear. I'm very happy that uh, you didn't just pull an article out saying, Tom, this is the article you missed about play going on Tuesday afternoon in uh, 1598, uh, because I've looked for it and I've just wondered how they. Uh, you know, and, and Ger, Ger gives us, Andrew Ger, by the way, uh, who gives us a picture of the citizen, the, the, the civic person, which there were, but I'm not sure if there are enough of those. It, it thins out as you go up the social hierarchy. Yeah. And, and so, yes, the citizen may have had a life of leisure or somewhat, or could get off maybe a day or two days during the week to, to go to the theater. And, and maybe that was it. Maybe you could, if you were an apprentice, uh, ask your master for a day off, or you had, of course, probably had a day off, but that day off was usually Sunday. And they, Sunday, didn't, want yeah. you, they didn't want you <laughs> in the theater. They wanted you, well, they they required you to go to church. It was uh, required. Uh, so you can see with that competition and that, yes. I mean, there is also, right, if you look at, if you look closely at Hensler's diary, like one thing that's clear is that on holidays, he makes much more money than any other days, including Good Friday, which kind of cracks me up because you'd think like if 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 the authorities would be against like days uh, like performing on certain days, well, surely Good Friday must be one of them. Nope. Um, <laughs> um, but um, at Christmas, Easter, Whitsun, um, so the, the 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 Christian high holidays are basically the theaters best performing days. Now, one way of thinking about this is that maybe they could charge more on those days. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't actually have, so what we have in Hensler's diary are figures. We have have simply, we have box office revenues, basically. And And it's only the bit that Hensler gets. And as the owner of the theater, all he got was half the takings from the galleries. So from the the side bits, mm-hmm. um, the, the upstairs bits. You didn't get any of the money p- that people paid to get into the yard of the theater. Mm-hmm. So it's not half the revenues, it's, it's less than half. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also the, the more well-to-do people whose money we, we see in Henslow. Um, but what we don't have is a corresponding number that tells us how many people those revenues responded to, corresponded to. So we can't actually tell how full the theater was on any given day. Mm-hmm. Um, what we can kind of tell, there's sort of a maximum amount. Like it's, he, he, he can't really make more than, um, I think it's something like three pounds and, and five, uh, um, five shillings, something like that. It's, a, uh, it's about 70, yeah, yeah, it's about 72 shillings. I think it's the max he ever makes. Mm-hmm. So that seems to be capacity. Um, now, either the days when he makes that maximum amount, they charged more for some reason, because it's a special day or it's a new play. Or those are the only days when the rose is actually at capacity. And very frequently, the players performed in front of a half empty house, mm-hmm. which is, again, not something we gen- that is generally part of our narratives, right? The narratives are always like, well, these theaters held I don't know, people say anything up to 3,000, which is almost certainly totally wrong. But let's just say these theaters held 3,000 people. And so tens of thousands of Londoners every week went to the theater. Well, maybe. Um, It's also entirely possible that those theaters were never more than half full, except for very special days. And that actually we're talking about a considerably smaller total audience 
than we we tend to assume, um, which is a less exciting narrative. And I don't usually like those. I prefer to offer more interesting, but actually maybe a less exciting is also more interesting uh, narrative. But the sort of the sort of assumption that London was this this crazy hopping theatrical metropolis in the 1590s and thereafter for three or four decades. Um, maybe that's true. And maybe it's true that there, there was enough of an audience to sustain um, a surprisingly large number of theaters, but very rarely at capacity. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, I wanted also, this is selfish of me, but uh, uh, Andy Kesson and I have talked about this, but there does see, seem to be in London an unprecedented amount of theater going that you uh, is not rivaled anywhere in Europe that uh, I can see. There are theaters, there are famous theaters in, the, in Spain and uh, uh, well, they're uh, all over. But the um, uh, the idea of of this public theater going in a metropolis, I just don't see it in any major metropolis in Europe at this time. It seems that this yeah. is a kind of English phenomenon. I, I think that's probably true. You know, I'm sort of I'm I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant because I'm I, I but I I mean I think Spain comes the closest. Yeah. Like Ma 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 Madrid has multiple theaters. Um, but I mean, my sense certainly is that England is is the place where theater as a commercial activity flourishes the most and the earliest in the sort of post Roman period. Um, in that, in all the other, like, I mean, France, Paris, obviously, has, has Paris has multiple theaters. Yeah. A bit later, maybe, that I, I, I um, you don't have as many as early as in London. But they're not, I think there's a stronger link to the court and to courtly culture. Whereas in, in, in London, that's, notionally I means it's it's really only kind of true in the, in elizabethan london where i mean for legal reasons the all the companies have have noble patrons but they don't they they, they quite rarely perform at court um and i don't think there's a very strong connection between the royal court and and the, the commercial theater world that changes in jacobean london when when james and and and, and the queen James I and 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 uh, Queen Anne and uh, their their and, and not, various of their children um, have their own courts and sub courts and and entertain and have their own acting companies that they bring in more frequently than Elizabeth I ever did. So there's then a stronger connection between the court and the commercial world um, that I think is closer to what's happening in Spain and in and in France. Mm -hmm. Um, in some ways, but at that point, the commercial landscape already exists. Like it doesn't, the 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 royal royal patronage, extended royal patronage after sixteen oh three or four, um, doesn't. I don't think boost um, the number of theatrical companies. Um, it sustains it at that point, but mm -hmm. but the the flourishing has already happened, um, and so it's just ferment um, that that keeps the. <laughs> the, it keeps the dough alive, but it doesn't it's start right. it. Oh God, that was a horrible. I'm sorry. I apologize for that metaphor. Um, <laughs> but, but I, but I, but I do. But I, but I think broadly speaking, I think that's that's sort of one of the that's one of the the narrative, one of the existing narratives that I think is right. That England is a little bit un, un, unlike other places in Europe at that point. Yeah, and then the question is why. And uh, yeah. me being a, we'll get into materialism maybe right now actually, but the, uh, I tend to, you know, instead of looking at when uh, rock and roll was born, you know, I, 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 my question is uh, who who uh, created uh, when did radio stations appear ubiquitously, uh, the amplifier, yeah, because you don't have any of this without the technology, without the infrastructure. Yeah distribution and we do get a little bit we get a lot london centric there was provincial theater the very active provincial theater but the epicenter was london and the question uh, seems to be why london at that time early on uh and i think it has to do with uh several things but uh, uh i wanted to hear what you have and maybe I'll. Uh, I, I don't want to venture. I kind of want to hear what you. I kind of want to hear what you. What you. But I mean, I. I think it's. 
I don't think there's an obvious answer to that question, right? I mean, I think it's, but partly because there's a real question about the chicken and there's a real chicken and egg question, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I think once this idea that an acting company could just stay in London and not go traveling, once that idea had it's established itself, and we don't really know when that happens, but it certainly seems to have happened by the early 1590s. Strangers Men, um, uh, the, 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 the acting company of, 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 um, <laughs> of, of, of um, the Earl of Derby, um, the future Earl of Derby, um, it, it seemed to have been resident in London for about a year. Um, and they may have been the very first company to do that. Um, now, once they had made that decision, for whatever crazy reason, from that flowed new needs. And one of them is the thing you already mentioned, that if the audience remains the same, more or less, then you need more new plays. Mm -hmm. um, and then you suddenly become an employment agency for all those university educated young men who are just hanging out in London, being leisurely and trying to find patrons with their poetry. Um, and so now suddenly they can they can take they can they can put their blank versifying skills to a new, to a new use and just write plays instead, uh, or uh, as well as their poetry. And then once that happens, well, that probably becomes, if not quite self sustaining, at least a kind of self perpetuating machine. Right? That you have the people who write the plays, you have the people who perform them, and you have the people who want to see them, and that and that sort of chugs along um, until, the, un, 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 until the summer and then you go on tour again for mm -hmm. most companies um, or until the plague comes and shuts you down and then it, it actually is really bad because suddenly everyone is out of work. Um, but I, so I think, but I don't know. I, I basically, I don't know. I understand why theatres, I think I understand why theatres or playhouses start to exist in London. It's simply because um, there are these companies that travel. At some point, someone figures out, and this probably happens very early on. This probably happens in, in the late Middle Ages. Someone says, well, London is pretty big. Um, let's just stay here for a few weeks and then we'll move on. Well, if they're doing that, then they have to be somewhere where they're, where they're not in the way. Right? So at that point, a market square or, or, or um, a guild hall or something like that, or, or the, the dining hall in, in, in the middle temple, like the lawyer's dining hall or whatever, does, won't do anymore because you're in the way there. So you need an in yard or, or, someone, or someone's yard, or you set up a, a, a temporary wooden structure. And once you've done that, well, that costs quite a lot of money. So you might as well make it permanent and figure out what else you can put in there. Maybe fencing displays, um, maybe juggling acts, maybe, right? And so at that point, it's sort of, but, and then maybe at some point, someone, maybe, may, maybe the people in Strangers Men just were like, you know what, let's just see how long we can stretch this out. I don't feel like traveling anymore. My gout's really bad right now, and and our horse is lame. <laughs> Finding a new horse is going to be expensive. Let's just stay put and let's see how long we can put on these five or six plays until people stop coming. <laughs> and then maybe we can find a few bright sparks who can write us a few more plays. I don't know. And I'm making this all up, but something <laughs> like that. It's a, a, something. I mean, that sort of makes some kind of narrative sense. The technology evolves alongside. So the, the, the technology of the playhouse, um, the, uh, the, the, the modes of production. Um, and that's not just playwriting, right? I mean, it's also things like, where do you get your costumes? If you then need more costumes, um, you need people to make them. Um, and presumably they're not, they're probably the same tailors who make actual fancy clothes, but they must be able and willing to pay at a lower rate and with, with lesser materials that still look cool um, in order to, to produce affordable uh, costumes yeah. um, so you need that industry or at least you need you need a sort of sub-specialization in the existing tailoring industry um, and then you need people who build you props and you need people who where you need spaces where you can store all that stuff right like and none of that presumably exists in the 1580s right I mean it, the people who can do all that stuff but then they're not people who specialize in that stuff um, yeah, but there's there's the Elizabethan offices of rebels, and oh. and and uh, and there is evidence, and I'm not the first one to see this by any means, but there is evidence that they 
Uh, of course, they funded the making of properties, and they would allow yes. these companies to use those properties. And we know from Martin Wiggins and other sources that these plays that on the, particularly the uh, winter season plays uh, sometimes were played ahead of time in a public theater, which is great. Let's let's take it out for a test run before we go before the queen and uh, and her friends and uh and it seems that there was a lot of collaboration uh, there and also some, if not direct, indirect financial support. And I think Burbage uh, kind of a, that the theater may have arisen from that interplay between the Office of the Rebels, which was very specifically Elizabethan. It had existed before, but uh, Elizabeth really uh, under Tilney. And uh, I think that's one yeah. reason. And uh also, well, I'll get to a second reason, but I, I wanted no, to- No, but I like that. I think, that's, I think that, that, makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense to me, um, that that's sort of the jump start, right? It's sort yeah. of like the, it's like the venture capital almost in a way, right? Like oh, the, yes. the, the, the Office of the Rebels gives them, but except like once that's happened, like th that, that accounts for a few, like even if they get to keep all the stuff that gets built to them for, for, for them for court performances, um, that won't account for all the things they need, um, nor would it account for the stuff that the companies who don't perform at court regularly need. And then presumably out of that initial moment, um, it, what develops in London is a sort of support system, right? I mean, a, a, a support structure of, 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 of industries that not exclusively, because it's never big. The theater is never big enough to sustain uh, to sustain um, uh, sort of secondary uh, uh, industries long term. But as one contributing factor, right? I mean, I, I would imagine that the, the acting companies if after fifteen ninety five ninety six thereabouts probably um, become a not insignificant factor in London's um, tailoring, cloth working, whatever yeah. um, industry, right? Like Shakespeare in the Chamberlain's men's repertoire, not a dominant, probably not a dominant factor, certainly not a certainly not the only one, but probably and regionally specifically, um, a noticeable income stream. You connect you with some powerful trade guilds who, uh, yeah. who see the, the benefit of the theater thriving uh, for their trades and for just yeah. uh, for the good of the London economy, I guess. Uh, I also, uh, this the office uh, rebel is uh, Clarkenwell and also there is uh, Paul's Cross Churchyard and Paul's Cross Nave. And once that cathedral went reformist, the nave uh, just turned into there's nothing else to do there you can't go in and pray for the dead anymore they got rid of purgatory and so you have all of this space this enormous thing we i spoke with rose henschel who recently wrote a book uh, about the uh, precinct and the space of the precinct but it's just plenty of records about what went on in the nave and it empties into a churchyard that is surrounded by bookstores and there's an outdoor preaching pulpit i don't think it was the model for a theater but there's an amphitheater there. There's, uh, it was not, right. the, which, if you wanted to listen to a two hour sermon, <laughs> not the most exciting thing, but for them, it was, they, they were going through this cosmic change, you know, from one religion to the other and then back and then, right. you know, and all, and then those bookshops, I think were, were very much, uh, supposed to be filled with religious, uh, text. <laughs> to support, particularly in the Elizabethan settlement period, the new religion, and to give a good, you know, have your population good and holy. And they found out very quickly that with some funding from the crown and also with a lot of people interested in religion, that that probably uh, helped to, you know, support all of these Oxford and Cambridge out of work guys who wanted to do translations. And so we have English I text where, you know, there's now no real separation between what you might consider aristocratic taste where people are very red in their Latin and so forth. Ovid is out there in English yeah. for a long time by the time Shakespeare gets uh, there. Yes. And so you can rotate these plays back and forth in, in uh, among, it's just they're, they're fluid from, you know, the, the general public into the, the, the highest court of the land. Yeah. So, 
And I don't think that kind of thing happened elsewhere. Uh, it, it would no, be not as I mean, I, I, I don't think in, I mean, certainly not in as rich and multi-layered a fashion and in a way that affected as many um, aspects of, of, of cultural and economic life, right? I mean, I think that's, I mean, if, if, if you think, I, mean, it's, I think it is, I, th I think it's obviously significant that the two other countries or the two other metropolises um, that we can compare London to or London's theatre to at all, Paris and, and Madrid, um, and, and ni neither of them go through uh, the Reformation, and, and oh. nor do they go through Reformation, Counter-Reformation, and another Reformation in a few decades, right? I mean, that's, you, you, you're doubtless right, that we can't really uh, separate what happens in with the theatre industry in London from the, I mean, staggering, the kinds of change uh, that that English history of that period is is um, characterized by. Well, just the uh, space, so, just the space. If you're looking for, you know, every that's newsmongering in the nave. You know, where does the uh, where is the buzz? And they called it the buzz at that time. Where did, where do you hear the oh, buzz? Buzz, buzz. Yes. Yes. It's, and in, it's, there's, it's in Hamlet. Yes. And. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Buzzers to infect it's... their ears, Claudius. But uh, uh, John Earl the Bishop uh, talked about the buzz, the sound of the flies, like flies, and the drone always in the nave of the cathedral. He didn't paint a very. That's great. Yeah. And... I mean, there's that amazing scene in in, in Johnson Ben Johnson's "Every Every Man Out of His out Humor," of his... where they're where they're circulating. It's it's I think six or eight characters in the in the nave at St. Paul's. And they're, right. they're, they're, they're just sort of circulating. The, the, the scene sort of focuses on two of them at a time. And then they sort of, it's like a dance, uh, but they're all, they're, they're, they're all hucksters. Like they're selling stuff. Like one of them is, one of them is teaching you how to fence. Another is teaching you how to take tobacco. Um, and yeah. it's this sort of... spit some tobacco at Paul's. And it was either orange. I think it was a character orange. Uh, one of those, uh, uh, idiots. They're just they're portrayed as idiots. <laughs> Goes on a speech where he's quoting these fairly current text, uh, history of yes. and, it's, and he's is misquoting and, and and just Johnson basically putting a mirror there. Those types had to be in there, you know. And, I'm sure. And and they're getting their information just right outside. There there are bookshops all around that area, uh, including the yeah. churchyard and you know other places. So these guys are browsing books and they're trying to act like they're. Uh, uh, smart. And this in Romeo and Juliet is Mercutio's criticism of Tybalt being a pretentious uh, type uh, and their references, yes. you know, to, uh, to that sort of thing. I mean, you see it all over the place. I don't want to make too much out of that, but I, I do think that that contributed uh, that uh, suddenly this repurposed space accidentally becomes a, a kind of, I don't know, seedbed that helps support the drama. Uh, I, I, to, to, I, I know, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it's also, I mean, it's literally true. Three, at least three of, 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 of the major indoor venues are, are in, in, in former monasteries, right? So yes. they wouldn't exist. Like those spaces wouldn't exist without the Reformation. <laughs> they would, they, they'd, still be, Black they'd still be monasteries. Yeah. That's right. Blackfriars, Whitefriars, and Paul's. I mean, the theater yeah. and Paul's. And Paul's, but, yeah. Uh, which is not repurposed; it's purpose built, I guess, for the choristers. But the um, did they ever decide the, exactly where that theater in Paul's was? No, I, no. I, but they, I've they, been there's told been that they recent, have, and then someone says no. There, there is some. There's some good recent work um, on yeah. this uh, that's yeah. just come out in the last few years. If you really um, want to get into the weeds, uh, there it is. But yes, it's interesting stuff for for us. But the Black Friday, yeah. it's a fantastic example, right? I mean, like in that you have this space that's. I mean, it becomes basically a, a deluxe gated community <laughs> because the crown hands over apartments in this former monastery to courtiers and noblemen and, and some people buy space in it. And one of them happens to be James Burbage. And so <laughs> you then end up with this theater inside a gated community that for a few years isn't allowed to function because it turns out that rich people don't like having a theater as their neighbor. Um, one of those rich people includes the patron of Shakespeare's company, but um, 
but but that sort of like none of that would have been possible if that building in the center of London had not been taken away <laughs> from a now no longer existing church. Yes. Um, uh, and handed over to to um, people like the 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 and not commoners but the, the but citizens and 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 members of the aristocracy, um, and that obviously doesn't happen. I mean, it it happens it differently, I guess, in France with those tennis court theaters. You have these these royal tennis courts, yeah. and when royal when tennis when the sport of tennis falls out of favor. You suddenly have too many tennis courts that are standing empty, so they get repurposed as theaters. But it's not quite the same thing. It doesn't reshape the fabric of the city the same way that all these dissolved religious establishments or the reintegration of those religious establishments into the fabric of the civic space um, of the city re- changes what London, how London functions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I suppose you could extend that even to the places where most of the theaters get built, like the outdoor playhouses, since most of them are in liberties and those liberties exist um, because there is no longer, because they no lo- it's no longer church land, right? But right. that's where the liberty comes from. So, um, so you could say, yes, I suppose you could say that the reason that, the, that in a certain sense, and of course people have said this, but like in a material sense too, that, 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 the 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 reason uh, theater explodes the way it does in London um, in in the late Elizabethan period is because the Reformation has made space and and venues available in a way that uh, has opened up space both intellectually and physically. Um, by, by accident. I think that's a comp- yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. 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 Not theology, intentionally. The, 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 <laughs> the preachers didn't want this. But in some ways, they created it. This was their own <laughs> Frankenstein <Yes>. monster. <laughs> they created their own competition. I'm sure there are other examples of this, uh, this kind of uh, unintended outcome uh, oh. of, well, you know, uh, possibly uh, social media. You know, and we, we see, uh, <laughs> you know, when it began, it was a lot of fun. He, you know, here's a picture of, you know, uh, da, 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 da. and then it turns into this other thing that uh, seems to be beyond the intentions of the creators. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. You, I, we've moved from we've moved from we've moved from from funny cats to to racist abuse fairly quickly. I, yes. <laughs> and troll farms and a lot of yes. Yes. Uh, and and shifts in consciousness, uh, too. Right. Which, uh, arguably, uh, theater at that time uh, pulled on consciousness. Maybe not as hard as the religious settlement, but it pulled on consciousness. It's hard to you can't measure that. No Geiger counter to measure that, but. Uh, I, I do want to talk a bit about actors adapting to different uh, spaces, companies. It seems to me that these companies, and I'm taking as my evidence right now, just one thought, the Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay, mm. let's go out into the woods and this uh, head here will be our tiring house, that sort of thing. But there are other examples you see, but it seems to me that these actors were very versatile. They would go in and they would see the uh, space. They would say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and that they could move uh, fluidly uh, from square to protruding areas to from play, court venues and here and there, court, you know, courtyard places. They they knew how to do that. Yes. I, I, OK, so that I think is unquestionable. Right. I mean, partly because the generation of actors that Shakespeare was a part of um, and even the generation after that would still have had touring as a normal part of their annual rhythm. And right? mm-hmm. that, that going, that taking your shows on the road was just what you did um, in the summer, um, most years. And, and if you did that, you had to perform wherever. Uh, whatever authority held sway placed you, whether it was in a private house and and the noble person who you whose family and friends you were performing for put you in the the, the great hall or, or wherever, or whether you were in a city and they put you in the guild hall or you know like the, the, whatever spaces were made available to you to perform and you had to you had to adapt your performance to. So um, I think that was in their in their actually DNA. I think that's 
beyond question. Uh, at the same time, there's a reason to take the factor of long-term residency at the same venue seriously. Um, and to say, okay, yes, of course it's true that a company like the Admiral's Men at the Rose or the Chamberlain's Men at the Theater, the Curtain and then the Globe um, could have performed their plays wherever they had to. Um, and they couldn't have been precious about staging decisions and blocking decisions and um, spatial arrangements. They, 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 they were natural improvisers. That doesn't mean that they improvised every time they performed at one of the playhouses that they inhabited for months at a time. They, they must also have developed working habits that they could snap out of if they had to play elsewhere, but that they could rely on and draw on and maybe develop and refine in the space that they were in most of the time. Um, and I think from if that's true, uh, then that probably finds reflection in plays as well, and right? in plays that get written for um, for those spaces and those companies. And that's not new, right? Like, that's not a new way of talking about early modern drama. Like that's actually almost old fashioned, but I don't think it's wrong for that reason, right? Because obviously, I mean, even this is obvious examples like Richard II and the sort of dynamics of up, of up and down, of, of above and below, like when Richard appears, um, when Bolingbroke appears in the courtyard and, and Richard is above, but then he descends, right? Down I go. And that, um, the, sort of, the, sort of, the, 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 sim the symbolism of that relies on a particular spatial arrangement that Shakespeare, when he wrote the play, could assume would exist because the company had been performing at the same venue for at least a year or two when he wrote it. And he, could, he presumably... He, is, he assumed that wherever they would pre pre perform next <laughs> or in the near future would also have a balcony. Um, and if you don't have a balcony, well, you can probably come up with a fix. But, but, the, but the assumption is that, that a balcony is there. And I think that's something you definitely can see developing and, 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 in, and being refined and things being added over the years. Um, after the 1590s, where playwrights rely more heavily on the presence of certain spatial givens. Okay, so yes, I I, I see that as just being completely logical, and uh, the director. Now we in our modern times, the first <laughs> when you look at the director first, there seems to be an absence there. Now again, if we take. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's assumed that uh, Peter Quince uh, is he's written, he's adapted to play from, you know, from Pyramus and Thisbe, and uh, and he assigns the roles, and he directs, and he solves the problems of production and so forth. Is there uh, an assumption that the writer, I uh, you know that Johnson, that uh, Haywood, that Marlowe, that they stepped in as directors also. I, there's an absence I, there. There's a kind of absence of direction. You know, who would it be? The lead person. I, mean, I think it's you know, a. It, well, I I wonder. I don't know. Um, I don't think it's. I don't think it's necessarily an absence, right? I mean, it's it's. I think an absence we perceive because we have since the 19th century been so used to the idea that someone's in charge but if you don't have that many moving elements if you don't have lights you don't have you don't have a set really you have some props some large props but whatever a table does not a set make <laughs> it's the, um you i mean it can of course <laughs> in a modern setting but but um <laughs> I, I, I don't think you need a director. I mean, and sort of, I mean, if you look at Peter Quinn's, he assigns the roles, and when asked, he tells them quickly what the role is, right? Like, what is Pyramus? Like, is it, um, but um, it, now you can see the same thing in Moliere. He has a short play that's basically about the rehearsal of a play. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And in that, you see what he's doing. Like he's basically he hands out the roles. He tells the various actors of his company what they're playing. He tells them what kind of role that is. He sort of reminds some of the actors how to play that kind of role, and what not to do. As a don't do this, do that. But then they go. <laughs> that's it, basically. Um, and I think that's 
I, I can see like the prompter, probably the book holder, what they call the book holder in, in uh, Elizabethan, in, in early modern English theater, um, might have done something like that. I suspect this is another one of my, re my revisionist hobby horses is casting, right? Like how, mm -hmm. um, in a, in a, since a company was made up of like 10 to 12 sharers who all had an equal stake in the company, um, I think there were probably some of those people who had clear, clearly defined specialties, like your clown, who probably probably always played comic roles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and it probably there was probably a young guy who, who a young good looking guy who, who tended to play the lovers but probably not always um but then i think for the most part these people must have been relatively equally skilled and relatively able to take on an equal share of the labor over say the span of a week or two weeks like i do not believe that Richard Burbage in the Chamberlain slash Kingsman played the lead every day. That is not how a repertory company works. It's impossible, and right? it's physically impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can't remember all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, in terms of division of labor, it's insane. Like, why would one of you, for the same amount of money, basically, <laughs> be expected to work that much harder and put up with it? I mean, you could say, yes, actors love the limelight. <laughs> like they, they always want to be, everyone wants to be a bottom. Um, but that's not actually true. Like actors also enjoy a day off. So I'm quite certain there's one part. So we have these plots, right? these backstage plots that, that chart, the six or seven of them, that chart um, the order of scenes and who's in them. Um, and with, that would have been posted backstage and the actors could look at it so they know when they'd be on next. And one of them, that has Burbage in it as a, as a messenger. And ever since this thing was discovered, it's always been assumed that, okay, well, so this must be really early because Burbage plays a messenger. It must be early because later, famous Richard Burbage would have played the lead. Well, it's probably true that most days of the week, Burbage played a big role, but it's entirely plausible to me that there was a day of the week when all Burbage had to do was come on, deliver a letter, leave, and be done. And I, I suspect it was probably funny. It was really cool to have Burbage come on, hand over a letter. Like, right, it would be like on a, Ian McKellen coming on in a West End production, and all he does is hand over a letter, and then he's done, and he comes back for the curtain call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Judy Dench is like uh, in a five. Yeah, with my classes, uh, it's a good if you if the pay is e uh, is uh, equal, it's uh, good to be Julius Caesar, you know. But yeah, the, the joke, well, yeah, uh, the, the joke is that the uh, actor playing after he gets uh, stabbed <laughs> goes to the pub, and then he's reminded he has to come back and be the ghost. <laughs> so, uh, yes, he probably, <laughs> he probably had some drunk ghost. Uh, that's the stupid joke, but, but uh, <laughs> almost certain, no, but it reflects reality. I mean, that's just true, right? I mean, this, they, look, I mean, this is, and we, 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 I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about my sort of 20th century stuff, but you can see this, you can see these patterns in, in, in the practices of actual ensemble based companies in the 20th century. Like Julius Caesar is actually a perfect example. Julius Caesar is typically a star turn in those, like the, the biggest name actor in, in the company in, 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 in German repertory theaters, which is the, the standard mode of performance in the 20th century in Germany is often, Jul often plays Julius Caesar. Yeah. And I'm sure one of the reasons is, well, yeah, because the guy has many other big roles to play. Um, yeah. that's light, work. light work <laughs> yeah so having just like two big speeches one one funky domestic scene and be, and, and then a good stabbing i mean it's, it's fun work <laughs> why wouldn't you want to have that role well i want to go to your work on spanish tragedy i don't want to miss that hmm. uh, spanish tragedy for those who are not familiar with Spanish tragedy for uh, those of us who are, it's a huge play. It's a long play, but it's just huge it's true. in terms of its influence and, and what it, that pivotal moment where it appears and it has so much influence seemingly on uh, so much that happened after it came out. And uh, 
so you're doing uh, something for the uh, CUP Elements series on the Spanish tragedy. Yeah. So the the Spanish tragedy is. I mean, I I'm interested in it because um, over the last few years, over the last 10, 15 years or so, we've had a um, a scholarly consensus, I think, establish itself that some scenes in that play that were additions that were published later, that, that were published of, um, uh, oh dear, 1605? Um, the, 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 I should remember this, um, but the... Uh, Our brains uh, are filing leave. cabinets. We have that's this a, audience. That's well, yeah, said. that's... Uh, um, but the... the the, the the additions to the Spanish tragedy um, that are written after the play is already a hit. Um, that these scenes were almost certainly written by Shakespeare. So various various textual scholars from using methods of statistical analysis seem to be by Shakespeare. Uh, and and people who really do not agree on anything. Agree, uh, 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 most most astonishingly, uh, um, uh, Brian Vickers and Gary Taylor, who usually disagree literally about everything, and it's sort of a uh, it's wet out. No, it's a bright sunny day kind of scenario. Um, uh, Taylor and Vickers agree on this. They 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 wrap they 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 strongly disagree with their methods of arriving at that at those conclusions, but they agree with their conclusion. Okay, so um, now uh, the Spanish tragedy. Uh, is not a play that um, we had previously associated with Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting challenge to, to scholarship in that we, we have a play uh, that suddenly enters the Shakespearean orbit yeah. on a textual basis, but on a theater historical basis, the traditional assumption has long been that this is a play that is performed first by strangers men and then by at by the admiral's men at the rose i.e the company competing with shakespeare and that uh, 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 at some point and again if i had already written the book this short book i'd be much firmer on my dates um, but at some point in the early 17th century we know that ben johnson was paid to write additions to a play that we think is the Spanish tragedy, again, by the Admiral's men, and that payment is recorded in Philip Henslow's business ledger. Yeah, but I mean, originally, isn't there a strong attribution to Thomas Kidd right off? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, the I mean, the, the play is definitely by Kidd. Yes, the, is, oh, the, the okay. play so itself is, is by Kidd. And it's, a, um, and it's pretty strong uh, evidence. Uh, yes. I think in the, uh, on the title page, it's attributed to, but yes. but but we know but we don't know that much about kid and, and, right. and, and one of the one of the problems is that um, it, the play the, the play is called the Spanish tragedy. It also seems to have, there's also a play called Geronimo. Yeah. The 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 lead the 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 main protagonist in the Spanish tragedy is Geronimo. Um, there's a play called the second part of Geronimo, the first part of Geronimo, which is a sort of a comedy um, uh, associated with one of the boys' companies, primarily because a lot of the characters are referred to as small. Um, and then one of the later editions of the Spanish tragedy in 1615 and thereafter has a subtitle that goes, Geronimo is mad again. <laughs> that becomes apparently the subtitle of the play, but it doesn't seem to be what the Spanish tragedy was known as before 1615. So we have a bunch. Now, in general, um, the, the, the way scholars have read this evidence has always been to say, well, if there's a play called Geronimo and it's not called the first part of, then that's the Spanish tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that if we believe that, then we have a real problem with those with attribute with the apparent but we i think we can kind of call it a fact if everyone agrees if everyone who has studied this agrees that those scenes are by shakespeare those additions then you kind of have to explain how the hell shakespeare it becomes part of um how this play enters the shakespearean orbit because if it if it belongs to the admiral's men 
then Shakespeare, why would Shakespeare write scenes, supply scenes for a rival company? And in Shakespeare's case, quite literally, since Shakespeare is a member of the Chamberlain's Men and King's Men, um, unlike, I mean, there are other playwrights, right, who seem to be primarily associated with one company and then also do jobbing work with another. That's very different from the Shakespeare situation. Like Shakespeare would be, Shakespeare would be doing a disservice to his own come to his own income stream, right? By 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 boosting the admiral's men's uh, repertory. Um, now. Okay, so that doesn't make a ton of sense. So then you have to come up with an alternative explanation. Um, and that's where, so what's, what interests me is that this I think is a, is a scenario where uh, textual scholarship has produced an apparent fact or something that at least you know, the interpretative community that we all are uh, broadly accepts as near factual or as a very compelling hypothesis. Um, but, they haven't, like the, 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 the textual scholarly community, understandably, has not really come up with a good answer about well, what does this mean for theater history? Some of them have tried and they're really not good answers. Like there's, there's this sort of fiction that, well, after a certain age, plays started to circulate widely. And this sort of, gen this sort of gentleman's agreement that you don't play in other companies' plays was null and void. The big problem with that is that Hieronimo, i.e. probably the Spanish tragedy, in 1604, in the induction to Marston's The Malcontent, John Marston's play The Malcontent, becomes a play about which there is a complaint that one company stole it from another. Uh, a company of kids, a kind of children's company performed it, even though it belonged to the company that performs The Malcontent, when the induction is performed, and that's The King's Men. So if in 1604, the children can steal a play from the King's Men that clearly is the Spanish tragedy, when does the Spanish tragedy become the, the, I think we can kind of take it as read that A, the Spanish tragedy was not a free fall that anyone could just perform, nor, nor did, it, did it belong to another company, it was clearly the, the King's Men's company, uh, King, mm -hmm. King's Men's play at that point. Now, here's the, uh, this is getting a bit long and involved, but the, a Geronimo play is performed by Strangers Men at the Rose in 1592 and 3. We know that because it's in Henslow's diary. Strangers Men essentially become the Lord Chamberlain's men in 1594. The vast majority of the members of uh, the Lord Chamberlain's men used to be members of Strangers Men. So in order to believe that the Admiral's men performed the Spanish tragedy, you have to believe that one set of people owned the Spanish tragedy in 1592-1593, then gave it up, and it somehow made its way to the Admiral's men, who don't perform it for the first two years of their residence at the, at, at the Rose. It takes them two years to begin performing a play called Geronimo. Then the Admiral's men paid Johnson to write additions to the Spanish tragedy which cost them a fair amount of money. And then somehow within a year, the play then belongs to the King's Men again, who used to own it in their previous iteration as Strangers Men, but gave it up and then got it back 10 years later. And then immediately had it stolen by, by one of the boys' companies. Um, and, then, and, and at some point in that mix, Shakespeare also writes additions to the play. One more, one more quick thing. If you read anything about the Spanish tragedy, more likely than not, you're going to read that Edward Allen, the famous actor Edward Allen, played the role of Hieronimo. Um, there is literally not a single shred of evidence that this is true. <laughs> no one in the period refers to Edward Allen as playing Hieronimo. On the other hand, we have a whole host of references to Richard Burbage, the most famous member of the Chamberlains and Kingsmen, at least historically from our perspective, the most famous member of that company, performing Hieronimo, including Hieronimo is one of the few roles that is named in an elegy when Burbage dies. So it's clearly one of his most famous, his central roles. 
Like he's as associated with that role as he is with Hamlet and Leah and, 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 and Othello. Um, so if that's true, then maybe it's actually the case that the, the proper theater historical answer is that the Spanish tragedy is a play that belongs to Stranger's Men, becomes a play that belongs to Chamberlain's Men, mm -hmm. is revised by Shakespeare because it's old at some point. And of course, Shakespeare would revise that play. It's one of his company's important plays. Um, Hieronymo is Richard Burbage as soon as he starts performing the part, whenever that is, um, at some point at the theater with Chamberlain's Men, not with Stranger's Men at the Rose. Um, and then he keeps playing that role until he dies. Um, and the play never belongs to the Admiral's Men. But at some point in 1596, the Admiral's Men go, you know what? We should have our own Hieronymo play. People clearly care about that guy Hieronymo. Let's get someone to write this Hieronymo play. And they do. And it doesn't do very well. Like it's, it, that's one of the striking things about the Geronimo play that the Admiral's Men perform in Hensler's Diary, unlike the one that Strangers Men do. It, it's, it's a stinker. Like it's a really, for a new play, it does okay on its first night. And then it goes sort of, and, 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 and it, it really doesn't do particularly well. And if that's true, well, then maybe it makes sense that when they figure out, oh, well, damn it, it Chamberlain's Men, King's Men, they keep performing this stupid Geronimo play. We have this thing. Maybe Johnson can make it work. Let's pay him some money to spruce it up. Okay. Um, now, this wouldn't be unusual. Right? There are other plays. We know there are multiple, there are lots of Henry V's plays. We know the we know the Chamberlain's men had two different Richard II plays, Shakespeare's and another one. Um, there, there, there are plays about other about historical, not historical figures, but sort of figures of um popular lore, <laughs> like, um, like the sort of Dick Whittington sort of characters like that, that multiple plays exist about. We just don't have most of them. I mean, yeah. King Lear, they're two King Lear plays. Yeah, I was thinking uh, of um, Lear and I'm thinking of Hamlet. And uh, the, well, yeah, we could go through this entire, I don't even think you would call it an uh, evolution of a play. It's just uh, moving through different hands and so forth. The, uh, the, the We in our post-romantic period have a very strong sense of authorial attribution. And I stay right in, in keeping with it. Yes, you know, name on title page, other evidence and so forth. That that that's the uh, the baby of the writer but these plays were not holy relics yet and yeah you see it in Lear and Hamlet and other other plays well and plots plots in particular weren't right I mean we, we have so many examples of one playwright repurposing the plot of another play and our narrative typically is well that's because it's an older play and it's no longer in circulation well that may not be true it may it may in fact be precisely because it is still in circulation but it belongs to another company so you can't perform that you have to have your own um and I mean, you know, how many there are? There are only so many stories. And if you see that one particular story or one particular character does really well for another company, well, why wouldn't you hire someone to write you? It's essentially the same play, but 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 in different language and with maybe some different scenes. But there's, I mean, you can sort of see something similar happening with um, in 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 um, among the Henslow companies um, when they don't have. Uh, Tambling. The Strangers Men don't have Marlowe's Tambling, but they get a play called Tamar Cham, which is also a two part play like Tambling. Mm -hmm. And Edward Allen plays um, the big strutting main character in that play, apparently, um, just as he did in Tambling. But he couldn't when he was performing with Strangers Men at the Rose because they didn't own that play. So, what do Strangers Men do? I mean, I'm guess I'm, again, I'm kind of making this up, but that's what the sort of what a, a narrative that I think fits. Um, the Strangers Men buy a new play that is kind of like Tamburlaine. And I think that's just what companies did. That's, that's, that's what you do. Um, and, and so I think that's um, with, with the Spanish tragedy. And I think what we have there is a case where we actually can now see, because we now know, or 
<laughs> have, a, have something like knowledge that Shakespeare revised it, we can now see that what we actually have in the Admiral's Men records in Henslow's diary that talk about a Geronimo play is an instance of part of a universe of Geronimo plays. And we see this elsewhere, but there are multiple Geronimo plays in Germany, in early modern Germany, that, that derive from the Spanish tragedy, from performances in English of the Spanish tragedy by touring players on the continent. Um, and then Dutch and German playwrights write their own versions of the Spanish tragedy. And there are yeah. multiple ones of those, um, and they survive. Now, I don't think they have anything to do with the, with the Hieronimo play that the, the Admiral's men had, but the, the mechanism or the operation, the sort of the, the, the play making um, that gets triggered by a story or a, that, that has theatrical success um, is, I think, it, it, the same. And I think it's the same in like what we call source study. Right? Source study always sort of relegates the source to um, a previous period or a previous generation. Like it's the thing that is no longer theatrically valid or viable. And therefore Shakespeare gets to write his, the, the version that is now for the next generation. Yeah. But I don't actually think that's necessarily true. It, it's, it's the version that is for the company that didn't own the previous version. That doesn't mean that the other version was no longer theatrically viable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you see the examples of this so often in film uh, where you read about a film that the uh, writer was fired uh, halfway through, uh, couldn't show up sober or something, or director is fired, <laughs> There's a, you know, but the, basically the studio is the one, the, the studio execs makes, make those decisions. And uh, you, you could see that just in terms of organizational behavior, how that, that would have to be the case. Uh, there's, there's certainly the, in Shakespeare's case, maybe it's an exception, but you don't uh, very often have a playwright who's uh, has a very strong voice in the company. Uh, and so that's bound to happen, that kind of thing. Yeah. Now I wonder- And if they do, and if they do, if they do, they're mocked. Right, or, yes. or they sort of have to mock themselves, like Johnson, yes. Yes. At, the, at the beginning of Barth Bartholomew Fair. And I mean, it's obviously, it's kind of funny that he makes all these demands. Yes. <laughs> well, I wanted to move this in a segue because you know, I can trans. This is transferable to your German interest. Uh, now, you or uh, you are you were born in Germany. You grew up in Germany. Yes. yes. And so. Uh, you and we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but uh, the, there's a direct link in germ between Shakespeare and German drama. Shakespeare, in particular, was so, so strongly received uh, pretty soon, you know, it's, uh, by not just playwrights but philosophers. And if we take it into Austria, uh, there's another little joke that you know Freud's looking for a career path. You know, <laughs> he, he, he runs across Hamlet and he goes. That's it. <laughs> I got it. All we have to do is just diagram. The, the, this is it. And uh, so uh, that made this work. Uh, so, uh, but you you are more focused on Brecht and those uh, what we consider to be modernist and even postmodernist uh, type playwrights that uh, I'm sure were influenced by Shakespeare and others, of course. But uh, you you have that uh, connection there with the uh, German drama. Yeah, um, actually, I mean, th theater more than drama. Right? I mean, it's, I think it's sort of one- oh, theater, that, uh, theater, yes. Right, because yes. I mean, yes. it's certainly true. I mean, obviously I mean, in Brecht's case, Brecht writes an, an adaptation of Coriolanus. Uh, he, he spends a lot of time thinking about measure for measure earlier and turns that into a complete new play then. Um, he's, he's involved with two productions of Macbeth that are fairly, at, adaption like um so there's i mean brecht in a in a kind of as a writer um drew on shakespeare quite heavily and and, and found um sort of elizabethan dramaturgy uh um, um very useful for reinventing what drama how drama might be written and then staged in the 20th century um, between between someone like Brecht as a playwright and Brecht as a theater maker. Um, and, and my sort of interest in 20th century theater making is that 
the tendency in 20th century theater, and this is not purely a German phenomenon, but I think it happens in Germany probably more than elsewhere, to make new, th new theatrical art out of old texts, um, where you can speak directly to the present moment um, by doing something often quite aggressive with, um, with a text that has been around for centuries, if not millennia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is, it's a little, it's counterintuitive to the 20th century English in particular um, theatrical mindset, I think, where the, 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 the assumption is not that someone like Shakespeare is universal and therefore speaks to us, but that what is universal, that, that what is remarkable about plays like Shakespeare's and a whole bunch of other old plays that we call classics <laughs> is that they will withstand pretty much anything you do with them and will give you, will provide you with an occasion to speak to the present moment and present day concerns with their help, but not by submitting to them. Right? You're not going to say something topical by being true to Shakespeare, but Shakespeare allows you to say something topical without being only contemporary. So it gives you a sort of it gives you a sort of triangulation effect, right? You can you can it, you can bounce off something that is four hundred years old and land in the present, but only if you do the bouncing off. <laughs> um, and, and if the, the thing that you bounce off of is definitely not unchanged in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something that has characterized the mainstream German engagement with Shakespeare since at least the 19 teens. And it hasn't stopped. Um, it's a, it's a, it, a the, the, the moment when it's sort of the most problematic is from 1933 to 1945, because the Nazis didn't much care about talking to the present day moment in the, <laughs> from, from a perspective that they didn't like. Um, but the, but even then, like even, 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 even during the, even, even in Nazi Germany, you can see this happening. Um, but now what interests me very, very broadly speaking, is that, that that was also true in England until the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And very often, if you look at some standard accounts of the development of English Shakespeare, the narrative goes something like there's Shakespeare and then the restoration and people are still in touch, thanks to someone like Betterton, with what was happening in in. in Jacobean and Caroline England. So, and then, and then it all goes it goes terribly wrong. Garrick, genius actor, did horrible mutilating things to Hamlet, and then the nineteenth century is basically one long veil of tears where all these theater managers mutilate and destroy the text and and put it in the service of staging these gorgeous pictorialist of productions that took so long for set changes that you had to cut half the text and it was horrible. And then thank God along comes William Pearl in the late 19th, late 19th <laughs> early 20th century. And then Harley Granville Barker, who with the help of Granger and Shaw rescues Shakespeare and shows that you do not need to cut anything and you can stage all of Shakespeare like it's written and it can still be theatrically powerful. And then Peter Hall sort of formalizes that in the mid 20th century. And out of that, you get this English tradition that is now completely dominant in the Anglophone Shakespeare tradition. And to my mind, it basically, modernism, the modernist treatment of Shakespeare differs radically from the English speaking world to the continental, but particularly the German tradition. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we often think like in terms of, you know, the, again, the broad strokes theater history accounts that Germany is one of those places where freakish experimentalism has its home in the world or the or Central Europe, Eastern Europe as well. Um, and it's just weird and it's incomprehensible how this could possibly have happened, but it, that's just what it is. And England is very different. England is text focused um, in its acting. That's simply not true until the early 20th century. And the, the historical developments in those theater cultures are, are, are very closely aligned. Um, like that whole stage pictorialism thing is happens in England, influences one particular figure in Germany who then goes completely nuts with it and takes it back on tour to England and re-influences people. So the, the developments really go hand in hand until a bunch of Oxford and Cambridge educated people in England and a bunch of people who really like talking to editors. And I've, I've, I have edited myself, this is no shade, but <laughs> until, until theatre and editors start talking to each other too much in England. And it, and it takes a completely different turn. Oh, well, the, the appearance of Shakespeare in school uh, seems to overlap there, uh, that uh, of course, uh, uh, Shakespeare was taught at the University of Tokyo and at Harvard, I think, before at Oxford, uh, because, you know, that we can just read this stuff, you know, just like anything else, you know, Harry Potter. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but you do see the more formalizing, uh, more formalized versions, I think, as people went through the educational system and were taught by, in many cases, editors of Shakespeare or, or um people who are very much purist in you know how Shakespeare should be done and read it's, you know it, you know I mean the crazy thing is again like I'm I'm like I'm, we, we, I mean, we, we don't have time for me to go into any yes. into real detail about this German stuff but one thing that's fascinating to me is that there are sort of lines of development that are actually very similar even in the 20th century like mm. Peter Brook right who is, is probably the most important I mean certainly until the 1970s, until the 19, late 70s, is probably the most important post World War II um, English theater director, Shakespeare director right? in, in the English speaking world. Peter Brook and Peter Zadek, who is one of the most radical experimenters in German theater in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, were both educated by the same people at Oxford. Uh, and out of that, you get two really different modes of experimentation. And one of the huge differences is the role of the text. Like Peter Brooks' um, Midsummer Night's Dream from 1970s, this, this, this monument of radical experiment in English theater, because it's in a white box. And the, the, it, 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 it's, it's, it's probably the most famous Shakespeare production of, of the 20th century in the English speaking world. It's a constant reference point. Right? And for good reason, if you look at the prompt books for that production, he didn't cut a single line. And one of the most, one of the reference, like one of the things that is also famous, that, that people remember about that production, uh, if you read Peter Holland on Midsummer Night's Dream, or if you read some of the accounts of the production that came out right after, is how beautifully spoken it was and how, and, and how, how beautifully audible the poetry of the text was. And Brooke also spent a lot of time with the meter and so on. Um, the same three years before that, that guy Peter Zadek, who was educated by the same people at Oxford, is a, 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 a Jewish theater maker whose parents fled Germany. Uh, he grew up in England and then moved back to, to, to Germany in the 19, late 1950s. Um, cause, cause, cause he was influenced by, by Brecht and visits of Brecht's Berliner Ensemble to London. And he wanted to make that kind of theater and he thought he couldn't in England. So he went to, he went back to Germany three years before Brooks's dream, uh, Tzadik, uh, stages a measure for measure that is sort of similarly important in, in German 20th century theater history. And in some ways it's very, it's quite similar. Like it's a similar set in some ways. Um, they start rehearsing. And Tzadik at some point says, listen, we can't do it. This text, it doesn't work. Like we can't do with this text what we want. Let's change the text. It's in German though, right? It's, the... it's, in, it's in German, but 
there is a standard German translation of Shakespeare by Schlegel and Tieck, which is a romantic era translation that is as quotable in Ger and as quoted in German as Shakespeare is in English. So it's a it has a very similar status as a textual artifact as as Shakespeare's original does in England. So it's um, and certainly before the 1960s. Then uh, since then, people have started commissioning new translations often, and when um, but until then that was Shakespeare. And like when the way people write about this, uh, when, if you read German critics and theater critics and theater makers, they write as though they are performing Shakespeare in the original. Like their relationship to, to that legal cheek translation is as textually um, direct in a way as, as, as that of an English speaker to Shakespeare's original. Um, so when Sadek does that, it's kind of as, ra it's as radical as it would be for a, an English theater maker to say, hey, you know what, to be or not to be, can't that just be to survive or to live? Um, and I, I don't know so which one is better. I do, should should I yeah. be or should I just not be? But it's, like, it's, but it's not quite, it's not quite, it's, it's, it's which will work better for our purposes. And which, uh, let's, let's just change that. We, we're, we're here in order to make a performance mm -hmm. right now, in 1967, and we are concerned with this set of preoccupations, mm -hmm. and we want to reach this kind of audience, and for, therefore we're going to do this, and we're still going to call it measure for measure, and it'll still say Shakespeare on the title page, because we couldn't have done this performance without grappling with Shakespeare's ideas and Shakespeare's text and keeping a bit of it, but throwing away most of it, but what you get on stage at the end of it is a kind of, is a hybrid. I mean, it's the end product of a dialectic right? mm -hmm. <laughs> um, where you bounce against the work of drama. And so you have a bunch of performers, in some cases driven by a director mm -hmm. who tells them what to do. And in some cases, as an artistic collective that is shaped and inspired by a director, but has a lot of autonomy, um, in some cases by a bunch of, uh, of, of really powerful actors that a director watches work. And it really depends on this. But you have that as one force that meets the force of the work of drama. And the sparks that fly when they collide is the performance. Um, and, and those sparks is what the entire enterprise is about, not not either these egos or that ego or that text and these people's ability to speak that text. No, it's the collision. Um, uh, yeah, under the uh, kind of umbrella of what the Jan Kott, uh, Shakespeare, our contemporary, uh, that came out very strongly in the 60s, right? The idea And of super influential. Yeah, Everyone super. in German theater read that. Yeah. I mean, that's something Cott, I think, resonated in the 60s with a German theatrical tradition that really, I mean, it, does, it begins before the 1920s, but it, it, it gains momentum in the years after World War I. In very similar circumstances, if you will, to early modern London. Like in, in, you have a country that has just been torn out of a monarchy overnight and transformed into democracy. And no one knows what that means. Like when they're writing the German constitution in 1918, 19, they don't know yet whether they're going to have a Soviet style um, uh, sort of collective decision, decision making by, um, by councils, right? representative councils, or a direct democracy or a, a, a parliamentary. They don't know. They're inventing this. Um, and they're getting, women get the vote, censorship is abolished. Um, suddenly the, the theaters are no longer, um, every bloody German duchy had a theater that was, that, that basically was under the patronage of the local nobility. Those all became state theaters. So you suddenly, it's a very similar ferment as the one you find in, in, in late 16th century England. Um, minus the religious part, but only sort of. I mean, interesting stuff happens with religion as well. So th that's the moment when this idea, when this begins, this idea that take this old play and do with it what you will in order to make it speak to this present moment. And your primary responsibility 
is to make your art speak to the present moment. It's not to serve a, an old author um, and, and his, his text. Now that gets disrupted by the Nazis. And then after 1945, especially in West Germany, it takes a long time, not so much in East Germany. In East Germany, you have this party because a lot of the people who had, who had fled, um, uh, who had fled Nazi Germany, communists and, and Jewish theater makers, returned to East Germany after mm -hmm. the war because mm -hmm. um, it's their natural home. <laughs> but because there are also significantly fewer old Nazis holding high office in East Germany. So it happens early in East Germany that this tradition gets rekindled. And caught is one of the factors that really triggers it helps trigger that kind of engagement with old works as something that you can use to speak to the present moment in West Germany. Um, so it's super influential um, and kind of a, a, a sort of scholarly legitim, le, force of legitimacy, right? That, well, if, 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 if the scholar says we can do this, um, of course we can and should. Um, and so, but that's basically, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a tradition that hasn't, has no breaks, um, but it begins over a hundred years ago. And it's completely, it has been completely central in both parts of Germany since the seventies. Like that's that, this idea that, that theater is something, obviously you can write new plays too, but one of the central ways of making theatrical art is bring contemporary artists, ideally with a high degree of autonomy, together with texts from the past that because they have survived so long in different theatrical iterations, they appear to have a kind of elasticity that allows them, the kind of gappiness that Emma Smith talks about, I think is, is that quality. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, that allows for them to be reinvented and mistreated even um, in the interest of making new art. Um, and that is, that's just, that's now mainstream. Like this is not avant-garde in, in German theater. Like that's just what you do. It would be, it would be positively avant-garde not to do that. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to get to, before we get off here, I want to get to your reverse. We were talking about Shakespeare going to Germany. Uh, we're now we're, I want to talk about Germany going to uh, England, and that would be you. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as a student, I guess uh, you, did you go through your schooling in Germany and then go off to Oxford? So you went to all the way through what we would call high school in the, uh, yeah. in the States and perhaps uh, Canada too. Uh, and then you went to Balliol College, Oxford, no less. And uh, as a someone who, with the intention of studying theater and the, the type of stuff that were uh, English literature, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you were yeah. exposed to this somehow in your uh, German school education. So what was the turn there? When did you say, okay, I'm going to leave my country and go to college in another country? Well, I mean, it starts at some point with Sherlock Holmes when I was like 13 or 14 <laughs> Good. Um, and fairly desperate bouts of Anglophilia um, combined with um, something that I think, especially in my generation, was fairly common, a sort of sense that while I was born in Germany, I really had no particular investment um, in, in the culture or the country and that politically and its, its history is complicated, was so complicated that um, it was always going to be part of who I am, but not necessarily the place where I wanted to center my life. And you knew um, this pretty early on. You you felt this pretty early on. Um, in my late teens, definitely. Late teens, yeah. okay. When that formative yeah. time when you're making big decisions. Yeah. And then, and then you uh, abandon England for the uh, American wilderness. You make it over to <laughs> Cambridge, Massachusetts. Well, that was because of that was because of money. I mean, that's because of money. Like this, because the, they were <laughs> so they you got a good you got a good offer. Okay. The, they, uh, no, no, I've got. I mean, you know, you know, you know what what grad school scholarships. I mean, Aster like in many places that were like then. Yes. I mean, it's, it, yes. Well, it, it's the American. But, but uh, there was at least some, there was some financial support and there was none in England for I someone know, who wasn't know, English. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, making offers you can't refuse the American way. And so you, you were at Harvard. <laughs> you, 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 
<laughs> you did your work there. And then you abandoned the state you, and uh, went off into the great north into uh, uh, Canadian territory. Yes. Uh, and are now at Toronto. So this is quite an adventure. You know, we're, we're talking one, two, three, four countries. And uh, uh, of course, it, uh, three of them, the English is the main language. And you could argue that the second language of Germany is English also. I, yes. I, 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 I don't feel particularly polyglot, um, but <laughs> I, you know, it's a funny thing when if you, if you say it like that, it sounds unusual, but it's just, it was sort of a sequence a disorderly sequence of, of events. I mean, it didn't, there was also a bit in between there where I, I left grad school at Harvard and, and went back to Europe to make films for, for, for a year and a half and then, oh. and then came crawling back. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, in, in some ways, not to get too overtly political, but I do also have a sort of sense that the countries I moved to then abandoned me. I mean, like I, we were living in Ohio. My first job was in Ohio after grad school um, during the second Bush election. Um, and that was not a happy making experience. Um, and so the, 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 then fleeing to Canada was sort of, let's say Ohio didn't make it very difficult to, to be left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ohio didn't make it difficult. That that could be a country western song. I you know that uh, Ohio <laughs> didn't make it difficult to be. Like, to be left. I, I under I understand. You know I left uh, kind of sim uh, uh, two thousand second time in Japan two thousand three. And uh, I don't think I was fleeing the Bush. I wasn't very pleased with uh, the Iraq war and those kinds of things. And and I don't think that's stepping outside of a, any mainstream thought at all. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a very pleasing time for people, regardless of their political affinities. Uh, but uh, yeah. uh, also a good job, a good job. And in, in, uh, in my case, a long way away in Japan, in your case, not quite as far, but uh, far enough. Uh, so no, an important an important border. Um, but the, yeah. <laughs> there's also, you know, there's something, um, one thing I've sort of come to realize is that, well, we are hybrids. Right? And, and while my sort of early decisions to leave places had something to do with leaving things behind and, and wanting to distance myself, I'm in middle age now, I, I, I realized that they do make make up who I am. So if you had told me in grad school that I would spend 10 years, which is what it's been now, and I don't know how many more years it's going to take me to finish this magnum opus on Shakespeare in Berlin. But if you had told me in grad school that I would be spending a significant amount of my mental energy thinking about Germany, and in fact, would be sitting in a study where the my books on German theater, which is basically all you see here, have crowded out my early modern books. I would have told you that that's insane and you're in a fever dream. Um, no, no, that's but, expatriate. That's expatriated mindset. I'm, I'm Tom, the American every day in Tokyo. Interesting. I, you know, it, I, I'm more right. American. If I were in Ohio, I would feel less American than I do right. in Tokyo. Yeah. yeah. But one thing that's nice about Canada is because it is such a, a hyphenated culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and there's so many aspects of Canadian culture that combine um, European and North American, and at this point, you know, global um, sensibilities, um, that it, it, this does feel like home in a way that the States, certainly not now, but didn't when I lived there either, even though I was happy there, but it didn't feel, quite feel like home. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way that Britain only occasionally does, and increasingly less so. I guess I feel as 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 a high as a as a quite hybrid <laughs> with a quite hybrid biography. I feel I feel a lot. I feel quite at home in as hybrid a country. Oh, I, as I think that's perfect. That makes perfect sense. Uh, my son graduated Queens College in uh, Kingston, and uh, we've had I've spent a, uh, some time in Toronto and uh, you know in Ontario, and that, that's exactly what I sensed uh, the hybrid nature of it. There's a, a lot of diversity, a lot of people from other places, um, yeah. hailing from other types of backgrounds, and 
uh, a very comfortable place. It gets a little cold, but uh, it does. You know, we, had, but, we had we had we had we had seventy centimeters yeah. of snow today. So. Yes. <laughs> So the, being German, that's nothing new to you. So uh, I'm uh, originally from the... It, and it, it is, you know, it is, it, I, I don't want to like, end on too positive a note. I mean, Canada has its, has its problems too. It is a yeah. colonial <laughs> artifact. Um, <clears throat> we, we have a, a, a large indigenous population that is treated shabbily. Um, yep. The kind of picture of Canada that I've been describing is, is really urban Canada. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. it, it, they're parts of the country that are very different um, and where, where those sort of that beautiful diversity does not in fact exist it has its problems like all yeah. states my, um, son, some of them are... my son played high school football uh, and uh, they played a, a Canadian team in uh, American football uh, out in the country and yeah. and I was uh, zooming him from Tokyo and he says dad I found out something Canada has rednecks too oh <laughs> Oh, we sure do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Kingston's a nice settled town. And of course, Toronto is cosmopolitan. But yeah. And they're not <laughs> as geographically localized. As in this. Actually, that's not true. In this. That's not true in the States either. I mean, Massachusetts is a prime yeah. example, right? That well, he was a, trying to make socially diverse. He was trying state. to make me make me feel better because he knew I grew up in the country uh, also. So uh, uh, that's great. Now, Holger, I have to run off and teach a class here. And uh, I, uh, I could talk with you on this subject for uh, all day. Uh, to, to where you would just say, Tom, just stop it. I have to do something other than, <laughs> than, than this. But uh, uh, what I want to what I want to do is ask you to stay after we quit recording, uh, just for a moment, just to, just a moment. And uh, but also, I wanted to uh, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. I'm hoping that uh, happy we, to you know, when we see uh, uh, Spanish tragedies, a couple of things that you have in the cooker that are going to be out. Uh, I hope that you will uh, come back and see us. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of this, this is all grant funded. And I wanted to bring people here, you know, to right. Tokyo, like the real, like a person, you know, in the real world, but you know, we can't do it. And uh uh, and this has worked out in some ways very, very well because I can talk to more people. But maybe at some right. point in the future, we can uh, uh, twist your arm and get you to visit us over here. Uh, I've, I've, I've never been to Japan, so so I, I'd, be, I'd be more than privileged. Oh, you'd love to. it. You'd love it here, and they would love you here. Uh, my friends <laughs> in the uh, Shakespeare Association of Japan, my colleagues here. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Not at all. Not at all. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you.